on World News Tonight. Deadline day. US President Joe Biden defends his withdrawal from America's longest war. Another variant. South African scientists are monitoring a new COVID-19 variant. Race to rescue. California is facing the heat as thousands are forced to evacuate. Crazy cars. Streets of Lima filled with color and excitement as vehicles race to the finish line. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Ada Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage with the evacuation spree that ended on August 31st. President Joe Biden took responsibility for the tumultuous U.S. evacuation from Afghanistan, saying it was the best available option after a leading Republican foe described it as a self-inflicted wound that had made America less safe. With the Taliban tonight declaring victory in Afghanistan, President Biden at the White House marked the end of America's longest war. Leaving August the 31st is not due to an arbitrary deadline. It was designed to save American lives. Facing bipartisan backlash, the president, at times angry and defensive, standing by his decision to end the mission with up to 200 American citizens still stranded. 90% of Americans in Afghanistan who wanted to leave were able to leave. And for those remaining Americans, there is no deadline. We remain committed to get them out if they want to come out. But that move breaks this promise President Biden made less than two weeks ago. So if there's American citizens left, we're going to stay till we get them all out. The last soldier out, Major General Chris Donahue, commander of the 82nd Airborne Division, seen here boarding the final C-17 cargo plane Monday at Kabul's airport. The president touting the safe evacuation of more than 124,000 people as a, quote, extraordinary success. The extraordinary success of this mission was due to the incredible skill, bravely, and selfless courage of the United States military and our diplomats. While insisting despite the frantic final days and the loss of 13 U.S. service members, there was no way to carry out America's exit without chaos. There is no evacuation, evacuation from the end of a war that you can run without the kinds of complexities, challenges, and threats we faced. None. But Republicans are accusing the president of betraying Americans. When you surrender like this, you don't leave your people behind, man. And we did. And I'm afraid they're going to kill these people and hurt them the entire time they're dying. And two days after the U.S. says it foiled another ISIS-K attack on the airport, President Biden delivering this stern warning. To ISIS-K, we are not done with you yet. With the Taliban in possession of the Kabul's airport after the United States completed its withdrawal, the focus will now shift from the mammoth western evacuation operations seen in the past two weeks to groups' plans for the transport hub. The roar of jet engines over the skies of Kabul is no more after almost three weeks of frantic evacuations. And questions remain over the future of the airport under the Taliban. They patrolled the grounds on Tuesday, even posing for pictures in Afghan Special Forces aircraft. The militant group says that the airport will be up and running again soon. The country depends on it for vital imports. The militant group had pledged to allow Afghans with the proper papers to fly out of the country once flights resume though many are likely to be too afraid to take the Taliban at their word. Getting the airport operational again is also a technical and logistical challenge, as there is no longer any air traffic control and the Taliban have little experience of running an airport, least of all one that is a proven target for ISK attacks. The Taliban had initially dismissed the possibility of any foreign help in securing the airport, but is now in talks with both Qatar and Turkey. The United Kingdom is in talks with the Taliban to secure safe passage out of the Afghanistan for a number of British nationals and Afghans who remain there. For more on this, we have other than a world news special correspondent, Ranusha De Silva, reporting now from Kent in the UK. Ranusha. Yes, Shanali. The talks involving the UK officials and senior Taliban members are taking place in Doha, Qatar, Number 10 said. 
The Defence Secretary is understood to have told MPs that between 150 to 250 people eligible for relocation plus their families remain in the country. It comes after Taliban pledge to allow further departures. Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab said more than 17,000 people had been evacuated by the UK from Afghanistan so far, including over 5,000 UK nationals. He also said the UK needed to face the changing situation in Afghanistan and work with other nations to exercise a moderating influence on the Taliban. Former British ambassador to Afghanistan between 2010 and 2012, Sir William Patey said, engaging with the Taliban could help prevent a refugee crisis and avoid the country becoming a host for terrorists. In addition to the talks with the Taliban, the UK government said it was sending 15 crisis response specialists to Pakistan, Uzbekistan and Tajikistan to assist British diplomats in their work to allow people to reach the UK. They are expected to arrive within the next 48 hours with the focus of helping UK nationals, interpreters and other Afghans who are employed by the UK and those Afghans judged most at risk. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. And that was Adha Darana World News Special Correspondent Ranusha De Silva reporting from Kent in the UK. Firefighters battled in heavy winds to protect homes on the fringe of Tinder Dry Forest near Lake Tahoe from a wildfire that has chased thousands of residents and tourists from a popular resort destination in California's Sierra Nevada range. I lived in Tahoe 40 years and they never had a fire like that. Residents and tourists in communities near Lake Tahoe were sent fleeing early this week as a fierce two-week-old wildfire roared closer to the popular resort destination. Smoke and ash from the so-called Caldor Fire, raging through drought-parched forests in Northern California's Sierra Nevada mountains, has choked the normally pristine skies around Lake Tahoe for days, leading to an early exit by many tourists as flames inch closer. Talking about the winds picking up today, pushing it towards Tahoe. So that's why they did the mandatory evacuation. Evacuations in and around the town of South Lake Tahoe came as the U.S. Forest Service said it was taking the unusual step of closing all 18 national forests in California to the public in the midst of a fire season already shaping up as one of the worst on record. Traffic backed up as thousands tried to flee at once. More than 6,800 wildfires have blackened an estimated 1.7 million acres within California alone this season, much of it on Forest Service property, putting 2021 on pace to surpass last year's record amount of landscape consumed by flames. The Caldor blaze near Lake Tahoe has emerged as one of the most destructive and disruptive this summer, spreading across more than 177,000 acres since August 14th with firefighters managing to carve containment lines around just 14% of its perimeter as of Monday. South Korea has become just the 14th country in the world to make into law its carbon neutrality goal as the Na National Assembly passed the Framework Act on Carbon Neutrality and Green Growth. South Korean lawmakers on Tuesday passed the Framework Act on Carbon Neutrality and Green Growth, one that's expected to serve as a basis for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. The legislature stipulates the goal of cutting emissions in 2030 by 35 percent or more from 2018 levels. The 2030 reduction goal is dubbed internationally as a Nationally Determined Contribution, or NDC, which indicates each country's efforts to slash emissions in accordance with the 2015 Paris Agreement. This makes South Korea the 14th country to legislate a carbon neutrality act. The act also provides legal backing for the country's Presidential Committee on Carbon Neutrality that was launched in May. Local business circles have expressed concerns over the legislature, saying it does not fully reflect their opinions. South Korea's five major business organizations, including the Korea Chamber of Commerce and Industry and Korea International Trade Association, have pointed out that South Korea has a lot of manufacturing industries compared to many other advanced countries. While acknowledging the 2050 carbon neutrality goal is an inevitable global vision going forward, they also urge the government to lay out specific goals and strategies by sufficiently reflecting the short period of time Korea has to achieve its goal. The latest on the COVID crisis right after this break, you're watching World News.
Welcome back and moving on to the updates on the COVID crisis. We have more grim news tonight. South African researchers are keeping a close eye on the infection rates of a new coronavirus C.1.2 variant. It is only present at low levels in the country, but its mutations are similar to hypertransmissible strains like the Delta variant. South African scientists have detected a new coronavirus variant. And C.1.2, as it's called, has them worried. A little table. Shows. That's because, according to a study, it contains many of the mutations associated with the most concerning variants the world has yet seen. But at the same time, the World Health Organization said on Tuesday that C.1.2 does not seem to be spreading. The exact threat from this variant we don't really know yet. Richard Lessels is an infectious diseases expert and one of the study's authors. The reason we were worried about the kind of combination of mutations was that uh, many of the mutations we see in, in this C.1.2 are the same mutations we've seen in some of the other variants of concern, particularly the, the beta and the alpha and the, the gamma, but it's in a different combination. Lessel said that the main fears are that C.1.2 is especially transmissible or is able to get around some of the immunity provided by either vaccines or prior infection. He said the new variant, which was first detected in May, may have more immune evasion properties than the fast-spreading Delta variant, based on its pattern of mutations. Laboratory tests are underway to establish how well the variant is neutralised by antibodies. Lessels said C.1.2 is a reminder to South Africa and the world that the pandemic is not yet over. When we get to the kind of come out of another wave, we, we want to think that's the, the last wave or that's the worst of, of it over. But this virus is still changing. It is still finding ways to, to keep infecting people. And we have to take that seriously and we have to do everything we can uh, to bring down the rates of transmission. The South African study's findings have been flagged to the WHO. On Tuesday, a WHO spokesperson said C.1.2 did not appear to be increasing in circulation, adding that it was not currently classified as a variant of concern. However, the spokesperson said that the WHO will continue to monitor the variant as the virus evolves. EU Chief Ursula von der Leyen said 70% of adults in the European Union were now fully vaccinated against COVID-19, hitting an end of summer target the bloc set for itself in January. It was an end-of-summer target the European Union had set for itself back in January and on Tuesday, Commission President Ursula von der Leyen was happy to tick the box. 70% of adults in the European Union are now fully vaccinated and that is more than 250 million people who are immunised. And this is a great achievement which really shows what we can do when we work together. The EU, however, has stressed the need to reduce the worrying gap in vaccination rates between its 27 member states. Malta and Ireland, for example, have the highest coverage, with over 85% of adults vaccinated. But in Bulgaria, only about one-fifth of adults have received the required doses. Europe is seeing a rapid rise in COVID-19 infections and hospitalizations. The World Health Organization has warned 236,000 more Europeans could die from the virus by December. At a time when public health and social distancing measures are being relaxed in many countries, the WHO says vaccine acceptance is crucial. This as people continue to take to the streets in large anti-vaccine protests, including in France, Germany and Greece. Brazilian researchers have found that a molecule in the venom of a type of snake inhibited coronavirus reproduction in monkey cells, a possible first step towards a drug to combat the virus causing COVID-19. This highly venomous snake could hold a key to fighting the virus that causes COVID-19. At least that's the hope of these researchers in Brazil who say they found that a molecule in the venom of the deadly Jara Rakusu pit viper inhibited coronavirus reproduction in monkey cells by 75 percent 
a possible first step toward a drug to combat the disease. It's the first step in a long journey. The process is a very long one. Professor Rafael Guido of the University of Sao Paulo authored the study. We were able to see that the peptides in the venom not only inhibited the development of the virus in vitro, inside the cell, but we were also able to see here in the lab that it was able to inhibit one of the proteins that is very important for the virus's ability to multiply. Guido said the peptide or chain of amino acids can be synthesized in a lab, making the capture or raising of the snakes unnecessary. But Giuseppe Puorto, who specializes in the study of reptiles and runs the Butantan Institute's biological collection in Sao Paulo, still worries people will go out looking for the deadly viper, one of the largest snakes in Brazil measuring up to six feet long. A statement from the State University of Sao Paulo said researchers will next evaluate the efficacy of different doses of the molecule and whether it is able to prevent the virus from entering cells in the first place. They hope to test the substance in human cells soon, but did not give a timeline. The Delta variant continues its spread, causing Israel to report record-high COVID-19 cases. In the U.S., some southern states are running low on medical supplies. Israel presses on with booster shots as the country's daily COVID-19 cases creep upward. After seeing fewer than 100 daily cases back in May and June, Israel saw more than 10,000 cases on Tuesday, and numbers spiked at 12,000 in late August. But due to the country's high vaccination rates, recorded deaths are staying relatively low. And now the country is pacing forward with its booster shot campaign as it looks to avoid another lockdown. Israel on Sunday approved a third COVID-19 jab to everyone aged 12 or above. I wanted to get over with as soon as possible, back to life and all. So there won't be another lockdown which is a bit worrying, more than the vaccine in my opinion. Meanwhile, hospitals in the U.S. are running out of beds and oxygen. ICU beds in Alabama, Georgia, Texas, Florida and Arkansas are almost at full capacity, with the U.S. Department of Health reporting that there are less than 10 percent of beds left. And Florida, South Carolina, Texas and Louisiana are running low on oxygen supplies. Welcome back, and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. A bus driving along a main highway in the Peruvian Andes plunged to an abyss and killed at least 29 passengers. It's the second incident in a matter of days involving a bus plunging off a road in Peru. Residents of New Zealand's largest city, Auckland, had police checkpoints installed on roads, while the tough lockdown measures enforced to counter the spread of Delta variant of the coronavirus eased for the rest of the country. According to research done in Belgium, Moderna's COVID-19 vaccine makers make twice as many antibodies as Pfizer's. The study involves a group of 1,600 people whose blood samples were analysed 6 to 10 weeks after their second doses. European Justice and Home Affairs Ministers have been discussing the Afghanistan refugee crisis, vowing to exert joint efforts to prevent a repeat of the 2015 migration crisis fueled by the civil war in Syria. Hyundai Motor Group and the American Autonomous Driver Developer Motional have unveiled an image of the first IONIQ 5-based robo-taxi. The vehicle capable of operating without a driver will be used in public to ride services in the U.S. starting 2023. And finally tonight, families, children and parents displayed their creativity in a crazy car contest in Lima's San Miguel municipality, raising cars made from recycled materials. In an unlikely crossover, Dragon Ball's Goku defeated the Flintstones in the race. The overall winners were three friends who built a car inspired by the Dragon Ball animation. Second and third place were taken by Flintstones and Fast and Furious themed cars. This was an event where many people gathered around to cheer and have a good laugh after being concealed at their homes since the pandemic. The event organizers made sure that they had this event with a green cause and put to use some recycled material. Not only the participants but the spectators too had their share of fun. 
And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shinali. Until then, stay safe and have a good night.